This is me with bad hair in May of 2018 in New York with Swedish-born American pop artist Klaus Oldenburg. Alternatively, I could have titled this talk A Researcher's Dream Come True. Since starting at UMD in 2009, I've been visiting the now 91-year-old artist in his Broom Street studio in New York to conduct oral history interviews and access unpublished archival material preparing for my book manuscript, which assesses his early work from 1956 to 1965. Having had this much access to the artist has changed the direction of my research. For the first several visits, the charming and grumpy artist would tell me immediately upon arrival, everything has been said already and I don't want to remember. I persevered by convincing him that not everything has been said already. In my book manuscript, I offer a new reading of his sculptures, which developed out of an in-depth look at his understudied poetry, performances and films. The London Guardian noted in 1996 that the large-scale sculptures made him one of the biggest names in modern art. Here's a screenshot uh, from the artist's Wikipedia entry of large-scale sculptures, which started in 1969. Seeing is categorizing. A colossal spoon with a cherry on top rests on the grounds of a sculpture garden in Minneapolis near the Walker Arts Center. Seeing the world through the eyes of the artist is to see category confusions and fusions. The spoon as a building or historic monument. Not unlike Dr. Seuss, humor, a creative use of common things and surprising scale changes characterize the work as accessible and relatable. Playful objects with deeper meaning emerge by bridging difference across conceptual categories. You can think about schlop. Beautiful schlop with a cherry on top, writes Dr. Seuss in my daughter's favorite book titled Oh, the Things That You Can Think. Consequently, I'm asking, what is the beautiful schlop that the work makes us think about? And what is the structure of human thought? My work begins with an analysis of his writings and how his thinking about things outside established categories, stereotypes and dichotomies informs his art. What are the cultural and political ramifications to a building of bridges between what is conventionally considered as different or opposite? In one of his earliest poems from 1956, Things to See, he writes poetry as if it was a film script and he simulates the structure of a filmic shot sequence in poetry, thinking like a scriptwriter or a cameraman, several cross-domain mappings between film and poetry occur. Consulting recent intermediality literature from film studies, literature and theater studies, I assess the nature of these and many other intermedia relationships in his work. Intermediality itself can be described as a metaphorical bridging of two otherwise unrelated domains, concepts or categories of thought. Instead of using psychoanalytic theory that relies on concepts of the follows, the fetish and the dream to explain the absurdity of the common object, I explore the intertwining capacity of conceptual metaphor in human thought. I analyze about a dozen metaphors that are part of Oldenburg's large-scale metaphorical bundle, Art is a Theater of Vision. Stan Myers from the Daily Mirror reported in 1962, it's called a happening in crazy Greenwich Village. Nobody can understand what's going on in a happening. This is the common view in the sparse literature on Oldenburg's performances. Instead of asking what Oldenburg's ray gun theater means, we can ascertain how it programmatically rejects easy category identifications. We encounter frame conflations between opposite concepts, such as a scene represents a conscious or unconscious experience, a character is evil or good, male or female, identification is inconclusive. Furthermore, the 12 performances function as a meta-theater, mimicking the two different styles of underground theater available to visual artists at the time. One with junk on the floor and expressions of feeling called the maximalist approach, while the other is undecorated, clean and a durational approach called minimalist. 
In 1962, Oldenburg declares the store and the theater in the back room as a metaphor for human conscience. Quote, the store title is in fact a play on words. The store means for me, my conscience. By this he means whatever he remembers, whatever he sees, whatever he thinks. Modeling art after his experience of the world, the making of sculptures in a store is affected by a metaphorical conception of art as a form of common labor. Unlike Andy Warhol, who calls his factory a studio and wishes to operate like a machine, Oldenburg refers to himself as a butcher, house painter, dressmaker, sign maker or baker in a hands-on approach. The making of sculpture in the store is directly affected by a metaphorical conception of art as a form of common labor. Unlike Andy Warhol, who calls his factory a studio and wishes to operate like a machine, Oldenburg refers to himself as a butcher, house painter, dressmaker, sign maker or baker. Here the artist sits in his store. A concretist sound poem declares the plaster sculptures for the store set in New York's Lower East Side in a rented space as concrete thoughts. Sculpture conceived of as a complex embodied symbol of metaphorical thought. In 1956, he writes a poem acting as a cameraman, film writer, and editor. In 1965, he stages a cinema without film performance when performers act out common behaviors of movie watching, with the real audience standing on the side. The Mickey Mouse is a metonymic standing for the projector. Furthermore, the artist views the world through the lens of the camera eye metaphor. In a statement from the time, he notes, the mouse is a state of mind, it's like a thinking cap, and when I'm working at home, I should put it on, mental mouse. When he's working, he's producing art. When he's producing art, he's thinking metaphorically. Thank you.